Rep. Jake Elsey, a Texan by trade, recollected his Monday powwow with Rep. Jim Jordan in quite the genteel manner. He painted it as a very cordial tete-a-tete, one that found its resolution in the retired Navy pilot elucidating his hush-hush resistance to the Ohio Republicans' pursuit of the Speaker's throne. Three days on, when a cluster of Republicans antagonistic to Jordan convened with the Speaker in waiting, Elsie clammed up once more. It was not out of meekness, but rather to shield himself from the urge to let loose a storm of words in front of the assembled throng. I kept mum, Elsie confided to the press come Friday. Jordan, a firebrand conservative, had always been up against a steep incline in his quest to secure the Speaker's gavel. He needed 217 out of 221 Republicans to endorse him, an ardor that had turned away many a seasoned GOP legislator who preferred a more steady hand at the helm. The result, however, did not mirror his ambition, instead, it marked a defining moment that left him with charred bridges, perhaps never to vie for the Speaker's post again. Initially, Jordan garnered the support of 200 Republicans in a public roll call on a Tuesday, only to see that number dwindle with each ensuing vote. By Friday morning, the Republicans had retreated to their secret sanctum, foregoing their mobile devices, after a third ballot on the House floor. In an unprecedented move, Jordan requested a secret ballot to determine his continued status as Speaker-designate. To his dismay, only 86 Republicans, not even 40 percent of the caucus, chose to stand by him. This was a far cry from the 99 votes he'd initially secured on a secret ballot nearly 10 days earlier when he narrowly lost to House Majority Leader Steve Scalise, Republican Louisiana. Jordan's departure from the basement conference room that Friday was marked by brevity. He offered less than 90 seconds of comments and expressed no regrets about his ill-fated pursuit, mentioning the pleasure of working alongside his colleagues. And just like that, he left without entertaining any inquiries. The four years that Jordan spent attempting to be a team player, aligning with Rep. Kevin McCarthy, Republican California, and collaborating with establishment conservatives, unraveled in a mere week. Rather than uniting the Republican ensemble and laying claim to the most prestigious position in Congress, Jordan further alienated older colleagues who never quite bought into his recent transformation. He also stirred the ire of his newer peers, who perceived his relentless campaign on his behalf as unseemly and treacherous. Elsie, who had only recently entered office after a special election in 2021, moved from a position of quiet opposition to staunch resistance after certain Republicans received threats from far-right activists. He found Jordan's response, largely limited to a single tweet condemning violence, to be tepid at best. If you aspire to be the commanding officer, you must protect your people and look out for their well-being, Elsie stated. That was not handled appropriately, and that's when I solidified my stance. Despite his setback, Jordan is unlikely to retire from Congress. He will return as the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, overseeing impeachment inquiries of President Biden and investigations into the Department of Justice and FBI. This role will guarantee him considerable attention in conservative media, regardless of the outcome of these probes. His most ardent supporters in Congress remain steadfast in their allegiance to Jordan, criticizing their fellow Republicans for abandoning the fiery Ohio conservative. Rep. Matt Gates, Republican Florida, who played a key role in the removal of McCarthy as Speaker, voiced his disappointment, proclaiming, Jim Jordan deserved better than that. Now the question arises as to Jordan's path in the weeks, months, and years ahead. Will he seek to rehabilitate his image among Republicans who felt let down by his tactics, or will he revert to his former self, acting as an internal saboteur? As the longest-serving speaker in history, Sam Rayburn, once opined, Jordan must decide whether he wishes to remain the disruptor on Capitol Hill or transform into the builder of consensus. Over half of the 221 GOP lawmakers arrived in Washington after January 2019, and their sole experience with Jordan occurred after his reconciliation with McCarthy. They were accustomed to relative unity during their initial years, spent in the minority. For these newer Republicans, the past internal disagreements remained unfamiliar, and they associated Jordan with the vigorous campaign that secured McCarthy's election. Most of the Republicans from the 18 districts that President Biden won three years ago initially backed Jordan, trusting their loyalty to McCarthy and his support for Jordan. However, for the more seasoned Republicans, particularly those on the House Appropriations and Armed Services Committees, Jordan remained a figure whose ideology and policy stance clashed with their traditional security hawk views. There were long-standing disputes with Jordan, who had been open to cuts in the Pentagon's budget and opposed backing Ukraine, both of which diverged from their established orthodoxy. 
Despite the complex dynamics and pressures, Jordan's removal from the race for speaker was seen as the right decision by many, including Rep. Don Bacon, Arneb, who emphasized the appropriateness of the outcome. The events leading to Jordan's ouster began with a significant vote on October 11, when Steve Scalise defeated Jordan 113-99 in the contest to nominate a successor to McCarthy. Jordan's lukewarm response and lack of endorsement for Scalise were interpreted as a signal to his allies in the House Freedom Caucus to undermine Scalise. Within a day, this move led to Scalise's withdrawal. On October 13, Jordan became the nominee, but only after 55 Republicans made it known on a secret ballot that they would not support him on the House floor. At this point, Jordan's chances of winning a floor vote were slim, but his closest supporters launched an effort to pressure the holdouts, even against warnings from anti-Jordan leaders. The atmosphere in Congress and the media was further inflamed when several senior Republicans announced their support for Jordan, creating a misleading sense of momentum. Privately, lawmakers like Elsie were telling Jordan that he did not have their support. Despite these signs, Jordan persisted and proceeded with a first ballot on Tuesday, earning 20 GOP votes against him, including the surprising opposition of Appropriations Chair Kay Granger, a 27-year veteran of the House. This dramatic vote led to the realization that Jordan's opponents were becoming more organized, employing a strategy of gradual opposition to reduce his support incrementally while protecting themselves from political backlash. Jordan met with Elsie, Diaz Balart, and other holdouts on Thursday afternoon, a meeting that was more of a demand for his withdrawal than a negotiation. Undeterred, Jordan called for a vote on Friday morning, resulting in 25 Republicans voting against him. Subsequently, almost 100 more lawmakers voted to remove him from the ballot. This tumultuous sequence of events only reaffirmed Elsie's initial assessment of Jordan's lack of leadership skills. In the end, Jordan's ambitious bid for Speaker of the House turned into a whirlwind of chaos and division, ultimately culminating in his ouster and leaving the Republican Party to ponder its future without him.